I've got a video about SQ competitions and how to set up a vehicle for competition or for competing. But let's face it, most of us are just going to listen to our stereo. We're not trying to do a competition. We're not trying to please a judge. We're trying to make our ears happy and find the happy space that, you know, lives within us all <laughs> through the uh, magic of really awesome audio. Now, the first thing to consider is what sounds good to me may not sound good to you. And what sounds good to you may not sound good to your friend. But the important thing is you need to know what you're trying to get to. Are you trying to make something that's going to sound awesome to you and not worry about anybody else? Or are you trying to please the crowd? Do you like giving demos of your system and having people be impressed by how it sounds? Those are things that you have to figure out. You also need to know what kind of budget you're going to be working within and what kind of uh, alterations you're willing to make to your vehicle to get it to what you're wanting to get to. Another thing you want to know is how loud do you want it to be able to be? Because making something sound good at low volumes is a lot easier and a lot less expensive than making something sound really good at high volumes. It's a totally different build. So these are things that you got to think about again before you decide on how you're going to proceed with a sound quality system. Another thing to understand and to think about is what your vehicle is capable of doing to begin with. If you have a big SUV or a large uh, backside to your car where you've got a lot of space, you can invest in a large subwoofer system. So you have to think realistically about uh, how many subwoofers what type of subwoofer, what type of enclosure, uh, where it's going to be located, how much power you're going to put on it, all those things to, uh, to be able to do what you're trying to do. In this case, I got a big, huge ported box, but you could also be running a smaller sealed box or a smaller ported box. Or Usually SQ doesn't involve a lot of subwoofer or a lot of subwoofer power. But that isn't the case for everybody. In my, in my case, I've got a very loud sound quality system. It's just what I want. You're also gonna to have to consider your vehicle's electrical system. Is it capable of supporting what you're trying to do? What type of alterations or upgrades are you gonna to need to make to make that happen? You know, you may only be running a very small powered system and you may not have to make any changes at all. But most likely you're gonna to have to make some changes to get the vehicle to be able to provide enough power to handle the extra load that you're putting on it with the higher end car audio stuff. Something to think about, how are you gonna do that? How much is that gonna cost? And of course, you've also got to consider internal modifications like a pillar, speaker pods, door, uh, altering your door cards to be able to put more drivers or larger drivers in the doors, changes to the dash like installing a new head unit or changing out what you've got uh, possibly doing something like I did with a tablet uh, there's there's all kinds of things to consider there too but once you've made all those decisions and you've got the basic build of your vehicle figured out now you just need to know how to get to that destination so the first thing I want to talk about is subwoofer boxes and subwoofer types there are many things to be gained by running a ported enclosure. A ported enclosure will give you more output uh, for a lower amount of power that you're putting in because it's more efficient. It uses essentially the back wave from the subwoofer to enhance what's coming out of the front. So you have the front of the sub playing its thing and the back is getting run through a port which gives you at a certain frequency range will give you extra output so you can almost double the output or in fact double the output of a subwoofer the downside of that is is that it boosts that frequency at that frequency range but on the downside is below that frequency and above that frequency you're going to get a reduction because now you've got a back wave coming out of that port that is not synced up with the front of the sub, and now you've got cancellation. Same way as if you play one sub out of, out of phase with the other, they cancel each other out, you don't hear any phase. It's the same general concept. 
So there are something to be said for both of those operations and used properly, a ported enclosure is phenomenal, but it can also be a detriment depending on what you're doing. A sealed enclosure on the other hand can take a lot more power so you can send a lot more power to it. It's also going to have a much wider range that it'll operate in and a much smoother transition from one frequency to the other. Sealed enclosures also tend to be tighter and more responsive. So the subwoofer base isn't as boomy, but it's more impactful. Uh, it's more quick response, transient response. In other words, that comes over a lot better than uh, with a ported box, you might end up getting kind of a, you know, kind of a dead or a thump because whenever your subwoofer fires that note at the very beginning, then the port has to catch up with it. When the subwoofer stops, the port has to catch up with it there too. So you end up with a softer hit and a, and a softer uh, beginning and end to the note, whatever that note is it's playing. And some music like rap and, and, and uh, jazz and uh, things where you have a lot of deep bass, it's, it's not as much of a noticeable thing. But when you get into stuff where you have quick kick drums, uh, heavy metal and stuff of that nature, you start to notice it more. And, uh, you know, so for the discerning listener, uh, ported enclosures can be yes or no. Sealed enclosures are always going to work, but in order to get them as loud as a ported enclosure, you got to put more power on them. So it's a toss up, but there are good and bad in both of those departments and there's good reasons to choose different kinds. Now on to rear fill. Um, everyone has their own opinion on rear fill and your opinion is right. All of them are right. Like um, I said, it's all about making your ear happy, not mine, but if you're wanting to do rear fill and you're wanting it to be, you're still wanting to maintain a good sound stage up front. Uh, one of the things I would tell you is use a mid driver or a mid bass driver in the rear with no tweeters to help keep the tweeter locations up front because they're the what's going to pull the sound field together and make it work. Uh, if you if you use a uh, if you put tweeters in the back your ear is going to have a tendency to hear behind you. It's going to think about this is behind me. And that usually disturbs the sound field on the dash. So again, to each their own and whatever makes your ear happy. But if you're wanting to keep your sound field toward the front of the vehicle, no tweeters in the back, just run maybe a mid range or a mid woofer in your doors to add some extra bass because that's very non-directional and it'll, your ear won't have a problem wandering to the rear while you're trying to listen. Okay, when it comes to front stage, uh, from what I've seen, there is uh, about, really there's, there's really two different ways to tune the front. Um, and I'm, there's, there's more than this, but I think they both, the other, all the other ones fall into these two basic categories. You're either tuning for a very spacious, wide field, or you're tuning for a more a centered soundstage. Uh, in an SQ competition, the judges are usually judging a centered soundstage. So they expect everything, to, everything that's coming from the center of the sound field to be directly in front of them. And then the things that are coming from the left and right to be off equal distances to the sides. That's what you're looking for on the centered or focused sound field. Now on the spacious tuning, it's more suitable for everybody to enjoy it that's in the vehicle. Two seat tuning or just general enjoyment. And uh, that is going to have a whole different sound to it. You're still wanting the sound field to not be centered you don't want to visualize it you don't want to hear it coming from the center of the dash because that's off to your right but you don't necessarily want it focused in front of you either you want it kind of spread out in a big huge space and uh most people are happiest with that particular style of a tune 
So front stage, you got focused and centered over the drivers uh, in the driver's position, or you've got more open and spacious, but not giving you any particular idea as to where the sound is coming from. It's just coming from everywhere. Those are the two basic tunes that you'll run in your front stage. That brings me to my next point, the side biased sound. So whenever you're sitting in the driver's seat, you've got, uh, most people have the door speakers going on down here. And then you've got your left and right tweeter up higher somewhere. I've got a, a tweeter and a mid on my eight pillars, but this, the distance between these speakers and you are, are all messed up. You know, we're working with an environment that we can't like position the speakers where exactly where we want them. So they're all over the place. And right now you're sitting to the left side. If you're living in America, if you're living somewhere else, you might be sitting on the right. But regardless, you have a side biased listening position. So you're going to hear the sound coming from the channels closest to you a lot louder. And you're also going to hear the ones that are further away from you are delayed getting to you. And since the human brain is capable of picking up a sound and determining where it's at whenever you go around your head like this, you can literally hear the sound and know where it is around you. The reason you can do that is because, well, there's multiple reasons, but the distance from you, the delay of sound from going to get into one ear and getting to the other, if it gets to this ear faster, then the sound must be over here to your left. If it gets to this ear faster, it must be over here. If it's louder, it's also probably closer, right? All these things your brain can work out. So whenever you're sitting in here, your brain is doing its normal thing and it knows exactly where all the sound is coming from and it botches the sound field. So what you want to do is create a scenario by delaying the signals on the left or the ones closest to you and allowing the other ones to catch up, now your brain's going, oh, well, they're the same distance from me. They're getting to my ears at the same time. And your brain's also, by adjusting your, your left and right uh, volumes, you can also get the same, same thing. Well, this is just as loud as this is, so I must be right in the middle of it, right? Uh, so these, all these things can help fix side bias positioning, but... One of the best ways to fix side bias positioning is to get your main speakers as far away from you as possible. And um, for example, sitting in the car right here, uh, these speakers here are about two and a half feet away from me. The ones over here are somewhere around five feet away from me. They're twice as far away. They're two and a half feet distance difference, but twice as far away. And I really don't care how far they are. It's more about the ratio of how close this one is relative to this one. So by moving your drivers inside your cabin into areas where they're as far away from you as possible, you reduce the difference in the, the distance. You reduce the perceived and the, the ratio di of the difference by an amount. One will still be further away, but there'll be less difference in between them. One of the best ways to do that is with kick panels. Uh, in fact, a lot of uh, SQ guys will literally mount speakers in the floor all the way as far under the dash as they can get them to get them as far away as they can to, to make that, that distance less perceived. Um, and, you know, that works. So uh, kick panels, places like Q forms, um, Speaker pod, custom speaker pods uh, There's there's lots of places you can get kick panels now. They're relatively inexpensive. Getting those guys to allow you to move those speakers, those drivers as far from you as possible, are going to help tremendously in uh, being able to mechanically fix before you have to digitally fix. Which brings me to another point: uh, having your tweeter and your mids located as close as possible to each other is going to help tremendously with overall sound, the, the, uh, the overall sound being uh, more unified and, and not as 
not as separated. If they're separated, you can typically hear the separation. And now you can fix that digitally and make it so that it blends. But if you can fix it before mechanically by putting them together, then you eliminate having to fix them digitally. And the more, the more problems you can solve by physically locating things in the correct spot, the less time and energy and digital uh, uh, changes you have to make to fix all those problems. So less point more. source speakers are excellent. Coaxial speakers are excellent. Mounting your 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 your, your uh, mid and your tweeter just as close together as you can get them, that works too. Uh, all these are just options. So I'm trying to give you guys. helicopter so all these things are just options I'm trying to give you guys a basic bag of options and you can start kind of figuring out what you're doing in your setup and how you're going to accomplish these tasks so if you guys appreciated this information and found it useful be sure to hit that subscribe button and if you have any information you want to share leave it in the comments below because we're all always learning and we're all always improving our knowledge and we're always sharing knowledge with others. Anyway, guys, peace.